Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, even though we have divided the intelligent agent session into two different workshops, there's still a lot to cover. So I think um, we'll go ahead and jump in now to make sure we have plenty of time. If you haven't had time to join the Poll Everywhere uh, site, either on the web or via phone, I encourage you to do that. The instructions are going to be on the individual polls during the presentation as well. So you'll be able to see these instructions again. So this is the Introduction to Intelligent Agents and Replacement Strings workshop. So if that's what you intended to sign up for, you are in the right place. Um, pardon me. I am Lane Bryant, and I have been teaching and developing courses in the University Studies Department for about 15 years. And Kim Godwin, who is one of our instructional designers who you heard earlier, she is here co-facilitating. She's gonna monitor chat. Um, our other instructional designers, I did see them in the participant list too. Um, Karen Hine and Tara Perrin are both with us as well. If you have other uh, instructional design or intelligent agent questions after the workshop, I'm happy to answer them, but they are also all great resources and I'm sure would be more than willing to help you as well. Um, we're going to record this session, as I mentioned, and so you'll be able to watch this recording later if you would like to. So before we get into my um, expectations for our workshop today, I'm just a little bit curious about why you wanted to attend the session today. So if you would participate in the poll by telling me which of these questions is your top question about intelligent agents, that will give me a good idea about why you're here today. We'll take just a few minutes to do that. It's great. I see lots of responses coming in. So this is good to know that there are some of you who are here who are interested in just learning about the basics about intelligent agents and what that even means. It's an interesting term um, and not necessarily very descriptive. So also lots of you who are interested in why you might want to use one of these in your courses. Um, also lots of interest in how you might create an intelligent agent, which is something that we're going to do. And I'll say if you're really interested in how to create an intelligent agent after the, our workshop today, two weeks from now on March 30th, we're going to do an advanced intelligent agents workshop from one to two. And we're actually going to do some hands on creating agents um, as we go. So that'll be a better opportunity for you to actually dig in and try to create some agents on your own. Um, we'll do those step by step together. Okay, well, thank you everybody for participating. This is great to know exactly why you're here today. And hopefully we'll be able to answer all of those questions and maybe some more. So I have several learning objectives for you for this workshop. I hope that by the end of today, you're gonna to be able to recognize the three components of what's called a community of inquiry, which is a theoretical framework about teaching and learning online. I also want you to be able to determine some opportunities and strategies for uh, creating your own presence in your courses. And then I also want you to understand how to use replacement strings and multiple different kinds of D2L tools. And finally, I want you to be able to determine where you might use intelligent agents in your courses based on what you learned today. We're going to begin today with an introduction of the community of inquiry framework. And if you're familiar with this, and this might be a refresher for you, I find it really helpful for informing my teaching practice, this framework. It was de developed by Garrison Anderson and Archer in 2000, and it's their way of explaining the role of instructors and students in the online learning environment. I think that their definition is a good way to articulate some of the things that distinguish today, like a 2021 online course from an online course maybe in 2000 when they first developed this model. Those courses probably looked a lot more like correspondence courses back then, but they focus on collaboration, engagement, critical discourse, reflection, construction of meaning, and mutual understanding. And those are all elements that online communities need to thrive, especially interaction. 
it focuses on three different types of presences in the online learning environment. There's cognitive presence, which is demonstrated primarily by students. There's teaching presence, which is obviously demonstrated by the instructor. And then there's social presence, which is demonstrated by both students and the instructor. And then there's multiple kinds of engagement in an online course. There's the student's engagement with the content that you've created. There's students' engagement with your course design and your instructions and learning activities. And then there's the students' engagement with each other and with you as the instructor. And then instructors have additional responsibility for supporting the discourse among your learners, for regulating the learning of those students, and for setting a course climate conducive to learning and collaboration. So all of those things together represent the educational experience. And research shows that creating a safe, trusting environment for students to actively engage with content is really important for success in an online course. And as you can see, a lot of the instructor of the responsibilities in a community of inquiry are up to the instructor. And so that's quite a lot for the instructor to be responsible for throughout the online course. And so I think intelligent agents have a really interesting role to play in helping an instructor establish this type of community. Filling those teaching roles, the social roles, setting the course climate, regulating learning, supporting discourse, all of that takes quite a bit of time. And I know a lot of you are probably teaching multiple courses or lots of courses with high enrollment. And I think intelligence agents can be really helpful in those situations. They can save a lot of time and they can really enable you to demonstrate your teaching and social presence without sustainable increases in your workload. So I'd like for us to do another poll. I'm curious now that we've just hit on the community of inquiry framework a bit, tell me what COI element you find most challenging in your course. And we'll use this to inform the rest of our discussion to see what things an, an intelligent agent or a replacement string might be able to help you to do. So we'll take just a couple of minutes to do that. Engaging with learners is definitely a challenge. And obviously setting the climate, directing learning, demonstrating presence, all of that is also part of engagement. So there, um, engaging with learners kind of encompasses all of that, but it has its own challenges, I think also by itself. So a couple of choices for demonstrating social presence, which is a big one, and then directing and redirecting learning and setting the climate. So I find all of these particularly challenging in my online course. And it seems like no matter when I think I've got it down the next semester, I'll have a whole new group of students and they throw me a whole nother uh, curveball, and I have to go about my uh, course a little bit differently. So agents are something that I found that I can actually use in all of my courses that have been pretty helpful to me to demonstrate my teaching and social presence. So we want to talk about a few ways now that we understand the theory about a community of inquiry, how could we actually encourage that in our online courses. And there are myriad ways for us to demonstrate our teaching and social presence and I just wanted to discuss several examples with you. So the first is setting expectations. How can we help our students get a better feel for our particular preferences for our online courses? What are my classroom ground rules? What are my expectations for their behavior or especially for their effort? What can they expect from me? When am I gonna be available online? When can they expect me to return feedback on their assignments or answer questions that they might post via discussion or email? Um, I can tell you that students share with me that faculty expectations vary widely in online courses at MTSU. And so it's really helpful for me to communicate with them exactly what I expect, because I have set up my class in a way that I think is going to be most productive for us to meet the learning outcomes. And I want to make sure that they understand what those expectations are from the very beginning. 
Another way for me to encourage a community of inquiry is to personalize my contact with my learners. So addressing that my students by their first names helps them feel like I'm taking a personal interest in them as individuals. And that also using that effective communication strategy can warm up the environment. And we all know the online environment can be kind of cold at times. And so it just helps them feel like you're a warm, authentic person who's really interested in them and wants to see them succeed. A third way to create a community of inquiry is to uh, practice encouraging behaviors. So again, it can be very easy for online students to feel kind of distant and alone and separated from their classmates and from the instructor. And that, I think that distance gets even greater when students aren't performing as well as they should or as well as they would like to and they're not meeting their own expectations. Um, identifying students who are struggling and reaching out to them to be reassuring and to let them know they can still meet your learning outcomes is a good strategy for helping them stop out. But that takes quite a bit of time and energy to go through, especially if you have lots of assignments and engagement in your course, to determine which students missed a deadline or which students didn't submit a quiz or which students aren't participating in a discussion. That becomes especially challenging in higher enrollment online sections. Another way to demonstrate uh, teaching and social presence in an online course is by showing concern. So it's also important to identify those students who they're not even logging in or they might not even be submitting assignments. It's not just students who maybe aren't performing as well as they'd like to. They may not be performing at all. And so some students will be motivated to return if the instructor reaches out to check on them because it's easy to feel like like you're not seen in an online class. And sometimes if you let them know that you have noticed that they're not there, that will bring them back in. Giving feedback is another really productive way for demonstrating your teaching and social presence. And we all do this, of course, everyone is giving feedback on their assignments, but providing that constructive and meaningful feedback in a reasonable time frame not only helps students improve before the next assignment, but it also shows them that you really care about their learning. And one thing I have really discovered is that students, the timeliness of their feedback is really important to them because they do feel like you are more engaged with them as learners and that you really want to help them do better if you get that time, timely feedback back to them. And then a final way to demonstrate your teaching and social presence is by recognizing your students' effort. It can be nice to go beyond the feedback and just the grades that you're posting in the gradebook to recognize learners for significant effort or perhaps significant improvement. And so meeting milestones is highly motivating for many students. Um, not all students are going to be motivated by that kind of extrinsic reward, but lots of them will be. And fortunately, two D2L tools that I think of as virtual assistants um, are available to help us with all of these strategies. And those are replacement strings and intelligent agents. I would like to know how many of you have used a replacement string in your D2L course. And if you're not sure what a replacement string is, it's a code that is going to actually replace some part of the text and D2L is actually going to replace that code with something else that you would like to use. Um, the most um, prominent example is probably a student's name. And so we're gonna talk about some strategies on how to do that, but I'm curious how many of you are already employing this strategy in your courses? So it looks like so far we have a pretty even mix. Um, about half of you have experimented with replacement strings and the other half have not. So that's great. We're gonna talk about where you might do this in your class. As I said, a replacement string is a piece of code that is gonna allow you to put a placeholder in your course communication. And then D2L, it recognizes that that's a code and it knows what to do and it replaces the code with what you actually want to put there. So here's one example. And I know this is probably pretty small on your screen, but what I'm pointing to in the arrow is this says hi Lane. So this is the course homepage for one of my courses. And I've actually taken a replacement string that's 
actually sort of a little squiggly bracket and inside the brackets, it says first name as one word. And D2L recognizes that I've put in the string first name and it replaces that with the student's first name. So when the student logs into my course, they're actually greeted by name rather than just coming into a generic course. Replacement strings can make it really easy to personalize your communication with your students. And there are many places in D2L where we can actually use these. This example is the course homepage, which you can use that. You can use a widget design in your course homepage and you could actually use it in multiple places. And then another way is in the um, D2L email. And we'll look at some examples of that. And then also in your course content, the actual meat and potatoes of your course, you can use replacement strings. And then finally, an intelligent agent. And we're actually going to look at that. Replacement strings feature really heavily in intelligent agents. And so we'll look at some ways to do that as well. The first example of a replacement string that I want to show you is from the course content. So all of you are probably familiar with the overview page in D2L. And the first time a student logs into your course, they are greeted by the overview page. And so one way that I use an intelligent agent is I actually have a replacement string for the student's name in the welcome message. So at the top, it says, welcome to PRST 3995 comma, lane. So anytime a student logs in, it's going to replace my code with their first name. And so this is just a way to personalize the course content for the students the first time that they interact with your, your course. Another way to use a replacement string is in the course discussion. And so you can see here, again, I have put the first name replacement string at the top of the discussion forum message. And this is my first week uh, weekly agenda for the students. And so I'm greeting the student by name rather than using some kind of a generic high class. And I don't do this all the time, but this is just one example of a way that you could personalize content for your students if you would like to. There's also a way to use replacement strings in your emails with students. And it's a pretty popular way to send messages, especially with agents that you might want to send to the entire class, but you don't want to send 25 individual messages. A replacement string in an email is a way for you to send a group message, but to the student, it looks like a personalized message. So in this first example, I have used the replacement string for the student's first name again, but then in the student view, they actually see their name there. And I think an email that can be especially um, productive for a student because it does seem like you've reached out to this student individually and it shows that you are, it, is, it can be teaching presence, it can be social presence, um, it can be cognitive presence for the student if you're actually redirecting their learner through the email, but it's a way for them to feel like you are actually a real instructor that they are interacting with instead of just they're interacting with D2L or the computer. And as I said, replacement strings feature very prominently in intelligent agents. And so that's the next thing we're going to look at. I'm gonna show you some examples of how you might use agents in your classes and almost all of them use replacement strings if you would like to. Before we talk about agents, I am curious to know how you would characterize your experience with agents. I know in the beginning, we had a lot of people respond that they are interested primarily in understanding what an agent is in today's workshop. But for those of you who are familiar with them, I'm curious if you've had some experience, if it's been positive, if it's been negative, um, or if you are somebody who just loves intelligent agents and you know you, you can't live without them. So I'm just curious about your experiences. All right, so at least I'm glad to see so far, nobody has had negative experiences with intelligent agents, that's encouraging. But it looks like for the most part, most of you haven't tried your first agent yet. And so um, I'll show you lots of examples from my own courses about how I use them and some ideas that you might also like to incorporate. So creating intelligent agents, what exactly can they do? So in the beginning, one of our first questions was, what is an agent? 
So an agent is something that monitors students' activity in D2L, and then it's going to take an action that you have predetermined based on whether the criteria is met or not met. And so I use agents for a lot of different things. Um, and there are a lot of things that it can do that I don't use it for, but it's something that can actually do a lot of that monitoring on my behalf. So I'm not having to actually pay attention um, to a lot of detailed assignment submissions or discussion participation or logging in. The system can do that for me. And so it really does save me quite a bit of time, but then I also have it take an action that helps demonstrate my teaching and social presence. So it's a kind of virtual assistant um, that can help me do that without me actually having to do that on purpose throughout the course of the um, semester. So intelligent agents, they um, can monitor whether or not a student logs into D2L. So that means D2L globally. So for a student who logs in to just D2L at eLearn, it could satisfy that criteria. So we would know a student, they are here, they're at MTSU and they're engaged. Um, the second way that it is uh, an intelligent agent can monitor students is to actually monitor their login to your specific course. And this is the one that I find quite a bit more helpful than just D2L globally, because I often have students who are taking multiple courses in uh, D2L. And so them logging into D2L globally doesn't necessarily help me very much. But if they haven't logged into my own course, that's definitely important for me to know. And so it is something um, that if a student, if I notice that a student hasn't logged in, then I might want to reach out to them outside of D2L. I can have, and I do, the agent will send the student a message that says, I've noticed that you haven't participated in class or you haven't logged in. And I'm concerned, is everything okay? And then you also might want to reach out to the student using MTSU mail, because if they're not logging into their class, they may not be logging into D2L and they might miss your message. So this is just an interesting way that I can find out if the student's not participating. It can notify them, but then I can reach out as well. The interesting thing about agents is that you can actually have the system send you a message, the student a message, or both. So I'll show you some examples of how that works. An agent can also monitor students' interaction with a particular piece of course content. So in my course, I know my students are gonna need a refresher on information literacy course uh, skills at the beginning of the research course. So I can have the agent monitor students to see, did they actually view that module presentation? If they haven't interacted with that content, then I can have an agent send them a reminder to do so, especially before they're gonna to have to submit that Dropbox or end of unit um, culminating assignment. Um, that's also helpful if they're going to have to take a quiz on information literacy as our students do. I can remind them, you might not want to take your quiz until you've actually interacted with this piece of uh, content that I've created for you. Another way uh, that an agent can work on your behalf is if your course includes graded discussions. The agent can monitor your students' participation or perhaps their lack of participation in the forums. And in my courses, students are expected to post their first response to the discussion question in the third day of the discussion period. And so I have an agent set up for some of the discussions that looks on the fourth day to see who hasn't yet shown up and posted their original response. And then that agent can send the students a reminder that says, hey, I've noticed you haven't participated. Here's what we're talking about this week. I'm really looking forward to your insights on this uh, conversation. Hope you'll join us soon or something to that effect. And so that's a way for me to reach out to students to let them know, hey, it's easy to kind of sit on the back row of an online class, but the agent enables you to be a little bit more seen to me without you knowing that I can actually see you that well. And then agents can also monitor students' interaction with and their results on some of your learning activities or assessments. So different D2L tools such as the drop boxes or discussions, quizzes, surveys, checklist, all of those can be monitored through an intelligent agent. In my research course, I ask the student to monitor student scores at the end of unit quizzes. 
So those are something that I used to scaffold a lot of the terminology that can be sometimes challenging for my students. And then I will program the agent to send an encouraging email to students who don't earn at least a C on that assessment. And then the email lets them know, hey, I noticed you may not have done quite as well as you had hoped on this assessment. Um, but I want you to know that I don't want you to be discouraged. I provide them some reminders about the parameters of the quizzes, how to prepare better, um, which learning activities might help them do better on those assessments in the future. And so I actually have lots of experience with students who will respond back to these agents and say, thanks, you're right, I didn't do as well as I wanted to. And so a lot of times the agent can just provide a good jumping off point to get a conversation started between you and a learner who might be struggling. And as I said, an agent can, after it monitors the activity, it can send a notification to the student it can send a notification to you or it can send a notification to both. And there's some settings that you can change in there so that the system makes it look like that email's coming from you directly rather than D2L, the computer system. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today, but we'll go into that really in detail in the advanced workshop in a couple of weeks. I wanted to show you a couple of examples from my class just ideas about ways that you can use an agent. So the first example is a description of my welcome to class agent in my courses. This system is looking for students who've accessed the course for the very first time. And then I send a personalized message to each student who meets the criteria. And of course you could send an email to all of your students at the very beginning of class. But one thing that I learned from watching one of the D2L videos on intelligent agents was it's kind of nice to send a student a message where you say, hey, I noticed that you've found the course and I noticed that you've logged in for the first time. It makes the student feel like you are waiting for them. You are eagerly awaiting their arrival and you can't wait for them to start participating. And so I have started using this strategy and it's really great. Students actually will respond. And so I wanted to share an example of student engagement with that agent. So this was a student who responded to that agent email and said, I'm looking forward to learning in this class this semester. This feels stressful, but reading your email, giving me some information about what I'm looking forward to and how to make sure to keep track. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your email. So this was a great example to me of how the agent was set up to do all of this by me before the semester even began. But the student is responding back and now we've started dialogue. And I feel like in online classes, it's so challenging to get to know some of our learners. And sometimes these emails, it'll be great. Sometimes students will say something and I'll respond back. And you can kind of start building this discourse and dialogue with your students that is pretty challenging in the online environment. And that's a sort of a positive way to use an agent. The next agent example that I want to show you is um, more for recognizing um, maybe concerning behaviors of a student. So as I mentioned, discussion deadline is one thing that I'm looking for in my course. I, I discussed about how a lot of times I'm looking for students who have missed the deadline. But for the very first week, I actually have an agent that looks for the students who haven't participated by the second day. And I asked the system to go ahead and send them a, a sort of an encouraging response to say, hey, our discussion closes tomorrow. And that way the students still have time to come in and participate. So it's a way that I can actually not say, hey, I gotcha, you haven't participated yet and sort of shake my finger at them. It's a way for me to say, hey, it's, I know this is the first week and I know we're all getting used to how this course is gonna operate. Just wanted to send you a reminder that there is a discussion going on. Here's what we're talking about and there's lots of good conversation. And so we'll hope you join us. And again, students sometimes will respond. And so here's an example of student engagement from that type of agent. Someone who said, thank you so much for sending the email. I missed that we had the discussion due. I just turned in my video and commented on two posts. So this was an opportunity for the agent to let the student know. And it's also usually in the agent emails, I'm using pretty encouraging and positive language. So trying to demonstrate that affective communication behavior 
um, trying to model for my students how I'd like for them to interact with me as well. And so usually it is something that I think that they respond very positively to. And most of the time students do respond and say, oh, I'm sorry, I really did forget, um, I'll jump in. And so again, it's another way to make sure that they know I really do care about their learning and I want them to be successful. And I'm interested to know what they have to say. This is our discussion post. And so they're actually recording a video of themselves using the video note tool in D2L. And I, it very much helps me to get a better feel of who they are as learners, what their goals are, um, what their past experiences have been. And so I really do want them to participate in that so that I can get to know them a little bit better. And then the last example that I'll share with you is also another sort of missed deadline example. And that's when students haven't submitted something to the Dropbox. So I know um, if you're like me, you have lots of Dropbox assignments and it can be really challenging to determine who submitted and who did not submit. And I happen to use a late Dropbox strategy in my class. And so I'm gonna automatically extend the deadline for three days. And so when I send this email to students, I'm letting them know not only did they miss the deadline, but there's still time for them to submit that assignment. And so it says again, I noticed that you didn't do this. And then I try to explain how the assignment that they didn't turn in is gonna connect to either other assignments in the class or some assignments in their capstone, which is the next course they're gonna take. And so I'm hoping that by explaining to them how that learning activity relates to the learning outcomes and our course objectives, it might influence them and help them understand why they might need to submit that. I think a lot of times students have this perception that all of the work in online courses is just busy work, that we're just replacing the lecture with lots of reading and lots of writing. And what I want students to know is I have a really good reason for asking you to do this. And if you complete it, it's gonna give me an opportunity to give you constructive feedback that you can incorporate so that you can improve for next time. And um, I have find that, found that to be a pretty effective. And again, here's a student engagement example where the student says, I'm sorry. Of course, students are always telling us things are crazy and I'll catch up. But at least what I do know is if the student doesn't respond to that, then that might signal to me that I probably need to reach out to them again. And maybe I'm gonna reach out to them outside D2L in that instance, because especially module four, our, this course ends in module six. And so if you're so, sort of starting to drop out in module four, I might be getting concerned that you're not gonna succeed for the course overall. And so just looking to see whether the student responds or eventually doesn't turn Turn that in, that is uh, giving me a good piece of information as well. These are all, I know the past two examples are more sort of negative examples of where I'm looking for something that students didn't do well, but I actually also have lots of examples of the way that I might do things that are encouraging. So I happen to use the awards tool in my courses. And one thing that I'll do is I'll give students an award if they've successfully completed all of a module's learning activity activities. And successful completion means pass in this instance. And so I'll have the agent look to see when the student earns the award. And then I'll send them a happy email that says, congratulations, I looked at my records and I can tell that you have successfully completed everything in module four. And then again, I'll reiterate how everything they just did in module four is going to help them do everything that's due in module five. And so it's another way for me to say, great, you got the grades and you got the feedback, but this is just another piece of encouragement to help you maybe keep you motivated to keep on trucking for a few more weeks. I generally teach in the accelerated term and that can be pretty stressful and overwhelming for students. And so sometimes I think those little encouraging emails um, or awards are something to help, help them stay engaged, especially when things maybe haven't gone so great. Um, or if they feel like they're falling behind. So reaching out to them to let them know when they're doing well, I think is also valuable. So I know that was very, very quick and I want to show you some other examples or actually get into D2L if there's interest in doing that. But I know last time we did that, that was a little bit overwhelming. And so we decided to do the second workshop instead. But if you would like to see just sort of step-by-step step, one example of how you might create an agent for those of you who've 
top question was how, we'll do that. But now I'm just curious to find out after that very quick introduction to agents and seeing some examples, do you think you might like to use an agent in your class? And if so, then I really do hope you'll come back in two weeks and you can work through those um, with us together. I also want to share, before we jump over to D2L, I want to share with you some resources um, and we can send out this presentation so that you can have all of these links. Um, I found the first two links, the Intelligent Agents 101 and 201 webinars um, offered by G2L to be really, really helpful the first time that I started using Intelligent Agents. They're each about an hour long and they're nice because you can stop and start them. So whenever he goes through and he shows you how to actually do an intelligent agent, it was nice that I could hit pause and then I could go in um, and try to do that in my own course. And then the slideshow are just his slides from those webinars. And then there's also a link about replacement strings because replacement strings work a little differently if you're using them inside an agent or outside an agent. They work the same way, I should say, but the actual text, the code that you'll use is a little bit different. And then some other things about replacement strings and agents that you might find useful um, whenever you have some time. And so First, I want to just pause. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and then I want to see, let's just have a conversation. We can, I can look at chat, which I haven't been able to look at while we were doing this I'll and do. find out, does anybody have any questions? And then we can look at D2L if you're interested. Hey, Lane. So Kim, do you wanna catch me up on chat? Yeah. Yeah, most of them I think we've covered to this point, but I'm, I'm on Denise's question I'm not entirely sure what you're asking so I'm not sure how to respond to it so if you could clarify for me your question certainly um what I was asking is with regard to the um the automated emails the intelligent agent emails is there a means you you were referencing um being able to see which students have not responded and I'm wondering if there's any sort of re reporting opportunity within there that says these students have not responded to your email rather than having to go email by email if you're sending a number out. That makes sense? That's a, that does make sense. And that's a good question. To my knowledge, there isn't a way to automate it. So you can see which students receive the agent pretty easily without having to look through an email. But the only way that I know how to determine if a student has responded is if they've actually sent me an email and I notice that I get it. Does anybody else have questions not related to actually creating the agent? We'll jump into D2L and we can actually look at some examples of that. But does anybody else have any other just overarching questions about intelligent agents or replacement strings? Lane, do you have any good stories about where these have gone wrong? You know, something weird happened or, you know, something strange do like you. that? I have a great uh, example of how these have gone wrong that has definitely influenced my um, use of them. So one thing to be really careful about is to pay attention in D2L to the time that it says the agents will run. So on our campus, for the past several semesters, it seems like agents have been running at about 7 o'clock p.m. And that is really, really important because if you send all of your students a note that says you haven't participated and it sends it at 7, and they still have until midnight, you're going to get a lot of emails back from students. And I, the first time I used agents, it was sending the agents at 1 a.m. So I was saying, hey, don't check until Thursday, but 1 a.m. Thursday, that's an hour past the deadline. Well, we changed the time and I didn't catch it. And so I got lots of emails from students saying, but I did participate. So that's my first tip, definitely pay attention to that. And then if you ever happen to change a deadline, make sure you change your agent. I did that because of the snow this year in February. And so I gave my students an extension to post their initial response in the discussion, but I forgot to change my agent. So they all received a message saying, you haven't posted yet. And of course they were responding saying, but you gave us an extension. So setting up all the agents in advance is great, but when you set them all up in advance, it's easy to let them go on autopilot. So I would say, just keep in mind what you've done to save yourself all of this time, because it may come back to bite you. <laughs> so for any agent that you set up, you can, can control when it's, when it's activated? 
You can, and well, in fact, let me go ahead and jump into, let me end the slideshow here and let me jump into D2L and I'll show you exactly how you would do that. Um, let me log in and then I'll share my screen. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna log in and let's make sure you'll be able to see. Okay, all right, is everybody able to see my D2L shell? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you, sorry. You know, once you start sharing your screen, all the little tools on D, uh, Zoom disappear. And so it's impossible to see if people are saying yes or nodding. So thank you for that. Okay, so the place that you're going to actually find an intelligent agent is in the edit course part of your course. And I know Tara has shown me there's a really nifty way to actually do that up here a little bit easier, but I just am into the habit of going to edit course. And so you'll see intelligent agents are part of the communication set of tools. And you'll just click on intelligent agents. And you can see here my very long list of agents that I'm using in my course. The first example that I showed was the welcome to class email. And I think I'll use this as our example of how you would set one up. So the first thing that you'll do to create an agent is you would click new. And once you do that, it's going to ask you to give your agent a name and a description. And I'm just going to click edit on this one so that you could see one that's already filled out. So I named this one welcome to class email. That's a very good description that helps me remember what is this agent supposed to do. And then there's also a description box. And I tend to write pretty detailed descriptions because I serve as the lead designer for two of our courses. And so when I clone courses over, we have 35 sections, some semesters of courses. And so if anybody else wanted to use the agent, I want to make sure they understand what the agent is supposed to do. So if you happen to be sharing your course content with other people, having a really detailed description can be very helpful for them as well. And so this description just says that this will send an agent after they've accessed the course the first time. And it prompts the student about where I want them to go next. So I use a forum called Weekly Update and I let them know that they can also sign up for remind messages. So that gives me just a little bit of a clue about what I'm doing in this agent. You'll notice here, there's a status box that says agent is enabled with a checkbox. So when you clone your class, if you are cloning from one semester to the next, the default is going to be for this to not be enabled. So there is some work every semester to go back and re-enable your agents and to change those dates if you have it running automatically. So when you would come back in, you would need to make sure the box is checked if you want it to run. And conversely, it's very easy to deselect the box if this semester you don't want that agent to run. And I've done that multiple times where I've tried an agent and maybe it didn't work out quite as well as I'd expected. So I don't delete it because I might wanna come back to it later and tweak it. I can just unselect that box and then it won't run for me that semester. The first thing that you're going to do for the agent after you have described it and uh, enabled it or not enabled it, is decide who do you want D2L to be looking for? So this means that when the, when the D2L system is looking for activity, whose activity are you looking for? So I generally always just say, look for student banner because I don't want it looking to see if I had a co-instructor or a librarian, I'm not, I'm not interested in D2L monitoring their activity. So I always just select student banner in this role. And then if you wanted D2L to find out, hey, has, has this person ever even logged into D2L at MTSU? That's what login activity means. That means, hey, look to see, has this student logged in at elearn.mtsu.edu? You can see that I'm not using that for this agent because none of those options are selected. It's not bolded, it's not active. But for Lane, this particular Lane. one, yes. Yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you. Could you go back up um, onto the criteria? Why would you not select mm -hmm. all users visible in the class list? You could, I just have been in the habit of collect, uh, selecting student banner ever since I've run it. And so- Is I it the same thinking, though? 
Well, I think all users in the class list can also include things like a co-instructor or a teaching assistant or the librarian. Okay. Um, because, you know, D2L likes to hide things in tabs. And so there's like the list that has all the people and then there's the student tab that only has the student. I think when I select student banner, I'm only looking in that student tab of my class list, basically. Yeah. I think that's analogous to that. Thank you. Good question. Mm -hmm, sure. So you can see here, this agent, because I do want it to send an email to students when they've logged in the first day, what I'm saying is, hey, D2L, I do want you to take action the first time this has happened. And I want it to say, if someone has accessed my course in the last day. And so I've checked that radio button. And in this instance, we're not worrying about release conditions. That's something that we will do in the advanced course. For right now, we're just concerned about whether a student has logged into our course of interest. And then you can actually start choosing some different options. The first is, do you want D2L to take action only the first time it recognizes this kind of activity? Or do you want it to take action every single time? And so, of course, for a welcome to class email, I just want D2L to do that once. But you can imagine there's some other times where I might want it to do it more than once. One example might be discussion participation. You might say, I just want one agent that every single discussion, it looks for that. And so you could say, take action every time the agent is enabled. Um, in the advanced class, we'll talk about that a little bit. I don't use that method. I actually create a different agent for each discussion so that students get a different message because I don't want the agents to um, lose effectiveness over time. I don't want them to think, oh, she's sending me that same discussion email again. I want to send something that's new. So the next time it's about that specific discussion and how that content is relevant to them and how I want them to participate in that. So I do change them, but we'll look at that in the later sessions. And then you can choose to either send them an email or not send them an email. So you could, if you decide not to send an email, the agent is going to run and it will send you an email that tells you how many users it identified that met that criteria and then it stops. And so you might not want the system to send a student an email. You could see how that might be a way that you might want to approach students not logging in or students who haven't uh, submitted an assignment. Maybe you don't want the system to send an email. Maybe you really do want to address the student or call the student. So it is not mandatory to send an email with an agent, but it is an option. So for this one, I, of course, it's a welcome to class email. So I have checked the box that I do want it to send an email. And then I have customized the settings and I'm gonna show you where to do that, but it's in a different location. So we're gonna go through this um, whole screen of options first. And then you can see this is a replacement string. So in an agent, instead of having something like first name as the replacement string, it happens to be initiating user. And that means it will replace initiating user with your student's email, D2L email, I should say. This is not going to go outside of D2L. This stays inside D2L. And then I happen to actually blind copy myself on all the agent emails because I also like to be notified of who's logging in. So I've copied my D2L email address in the BCC section. And then I've created my email text. So I've got my subject line and then in the actual subject of the message, the text of the message, I'm using another replacement string. So in the PowerPoint, we talked about replacement strings and course content being first name, but for an agent, it's actually initiating user first name. I haven't found really good information about why that is, but I have learned if you do it the wrong way, it doesn't work. So um, it is important to use the right kind of replacement strings. And in some of those um, links that I provided in the PowerPoint, you'll be able to have a whole list of those and when to use each. And so then I've created my welcome message. I'm linking lots of things in the message, such as the syllabus and assignment schedule, my contact information. I'm directing them to that weekly agenda forum. I'm telling them how to sign up for Remind. And then um, I could also, if I wanted to, I could add an attachment. So if you have some instructions that are available as a PDF or Word, 
you could do those. You can also record a message or you could choose um, to add an image or something like that um, using the HTML editor up here. You could also add an image if you would like to. It has all the functionality of your course discussion and email. And then I can choose the schedule. So for this course, which was running um, starting spring of 2021, I did check the box that I wanted to use a schedule. And then you click update schedule, and this is where I can choose how often would I like this to run. So because I hope students are gonna start logging in very quickly, I want it to check every single day, and I have it repeat every day. But then I only have it run, I actually did have this one run the entire semester, but I'm hopeful that those students are all logging in in the first week, right? But just to be on the safe side, I put it at the end of the course because this was an A1 course. And then I just click update and then I can save that. And then every time from January 25th to March 11th, every time someone logs into the course for the first time, they will receive this message. Again, it will be personalized to their name. And once you do that, I will show you how to actually do a practice run. So once you've done that, they are alphabetized in your list of agents. So this agent is at the bottom and you can see right now it has identified zero users, but I could, if I wanted to, and that will, I didn't mean to click that. I could if I wanted to, if I've just created this agent and I wanted to see who would qualify if it ran at this moment, I can do what's called a practice run. And so I can say, yes, please run this agent and it's going to do it. It's going to, I'm just going to click done and hopefully it won't take very long. And I'll show you exactly how you get notified about that. But once it's finished running, you're gonna see here how many users it identified. So now obviously my course ended last week, it's not gonna identify any new users, but you can see in some of these other agents, eight users were identified, three users were identified. And if I click that, I'd actually get the list of names. But then once the agent finishes running, you'll actually get, and let's see, there we go. We're gonna get an email that says agent completed, welcome to class email. So that's just a very good way to practice it to see how it's gonna run the first time. And if it had identified anybody, they would not actually receive the email. It truly is just a practice run for the instructor's behalf. And then the final thing that I'll show you is how to actually set the email that the students are gonna see when they receive this from D2L. So the default is D2L help at mtsu.edu. So if you don't change this, when the student receives the email from the agent, it looks like it comes from D2L help. And I feel like that's probably not gonna be very effective. I want my students to see that the email came from me. So you can actually change the value here and you can change the name and the email address that it comes from. And therefore, when they reply to that message, I'm ensured that I'm gonna get the replies, that they're not gonna go to the D2L help um, black hole email address. And then once you save that, that will apply to every agent that you've created inside that course. Now, when you clone your courses for the next semester, that will not be the default anymore. And you'll have to go back and set up the settings. So you can see how every semester I have all of these agents created. When I clone my course, as long as I select everything that I want to clone over, it will clone but I do have to go back in, as you could see, and change those schedules. So I would need to edit the dates to make sure that they run at the appropriate time for summer semester instead of spring semester. And I know that's a lot. So I'm gonna pause and I know we just have a few more minutes, but I wanna make sure I'll leave the screen up just in case anybody has any questions about anything on the screen. But does anybody have other questions about how an agent is actually created in D2L? And again, I'll encourage you if you have interest in knowing how to create other ones. I'll stop sharing now. If you have interest in uh, learning how to create other ones in the workshop in a couple of weeks, I would encourage you to bring your um, 
laptop or desktop and we'll actually do them step by step so that you don't have to just watch me speed through them like we just did. We'll actually be able to go through and sort of pause and actually have time to talk about those. Let's see, I'm, let me go back to the chat. So Denise has a good question. To my knowledge, it does have to stay inside D2 L. So you couldn't use an MTSU email address in the reply, but I'll have Kim confirm that for me. Yeah, it has to be your D2L email, but if you have your D2L email set up to forward to your MTSU email, it will bounce out to that. Yeah. Okay. And then I see Dave's got a great question, which was also my question. Unfortunately, we cannot change the time that it goes out. That is set globally by D2L or by our instance of D2L, I'm not sure which, but it's not changeable by the instructor. So it's just important. And I didn't share that with you. Let me go back and let me show you where you would find that. So if we look, and of course, none of these, because my course is all already ended, we don't see it. But you would see in the next run day, if I had one scheduled to run after March 11th, it would say March 15th, 7 o'clock p.m. So that is where you'll see what time that agent is going to be sent, which I think is really useful again. So you don't send your students an email that is wrong. <laughs> don't make my same mistake. Learn, learn from my mistakes. Anybody have other questions about using agents? I know that is a lot and even we divided it up and it's still a lot. So um, I apologize if it was really, really fast. Um, but I would be um, very happy to answer, you know, questions if you have them. I actually have another meeting that starts in a couple of minutes, so I can't stay on too long today. But I've left my email address, which is lane.bryant. Um, if you do have uh, questions, please email me, let me know. Actually, Tara's still on. We have a great success story from a faculty member who was really interested in agents. And so Tara and I met with her and she sent us the greatest email afterward that said, I just want you to know how great it's going. So I really do encourage you to try it. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that students find out it's the computer and not you, or like me, you've not changed your deadlines. Um, it is, I think, worth the effort. Um, I really do. I meant to share a comment from a student on the evaluation for my course, and it was, I'm going to actually pull it up. I won't share it, um, but I'll read it because I feel like um, what I wanted to say to the student is, oh, this was so much the agents and not necessarily me. So the student said that it was a great experience with an online course. Thank you for interacting with us and facilitating classroom involvement, even though our class didn't meet in person. It didn't feel like I was left in the dark with unclear direction to figure things out on my own, which I have felt in the past in other online classes. So thanks again, I feel better prepared for the next course. And I feel like I didn't receive lots of comments necessarily like that before I started using agents. And I, I hope some of it, the credit I can take myself, but I think a lot of it is actually due to the agents. I think the students just can feel how involved you are and and how much you care about their learning because you're able to sustain this kind of interaction with them through this kind of virtual assistant from D2L. And of course, I'm still, when they respond back to me, then I am responding back on my own without the agent, but it at least helps get that started whenever you've got a big class and it would be hard to reach out to individual students one by one. All right, uh, Kim, thank you. Kim has volunteered to um, stay on for a few minutes since I need to run. So if you do have any other questions, she'll do it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.